والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم The battle of Uhud is officially over. Abu Sufyan declared to the Muslims that this battle is in return of the battle of Badr. And next year, same time, same place, we're going to come to fight you, so be there. And he left. The Prophet, Prophet والسلام, with his wisdom, he instructed one of his companions to go and observe them and to come back with the information. If they got off their horses and on their camels, this meant that they're going back to Mecca. But if they're still on their horses, this means that it's a maneuver and they're going to come back to attack again. And that's exactly what happened. They went, uh, got off their horses and got on their camels and they headed to uh, uh, Mecca. Now it's time for the Prophet ﷺ to check those who died and those who were wounded. He sent his companions to look for them. He sent one of them to look for Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a. May Allah be pleased with him. And Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a, as you recall, was the brother of Abdurrahman ibn Awf. He's the one who gave him half of his wealth and gave him the choice of one of his wives when they when Abdurrahman first came to Medina. Of course, Abdurrahman, may Allah be pleased with him, and this is astonishing. It's astonishing when you look at Sa'ad's attitude. Because the Prophet ﷺ told him that this man who came from Medina, who is a complete stranger to you, is now officially your brother. He shared with him half of what he owns. He did not hide anything. He went to the open and told him that the people of Medina know that I am among the richest. So, this is half of my wealth, take half of it. This is all of my wealth, take half of it. He could have just given him a hundred thousand or so. No, he gave him the whole thing and told him to split it into two. And he also told him that I have two wives, look which one you like, and I, it, it, it's hers, it, it's yours. I'll divorce her and she becomes your wife. Because you are in need, and Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with all of this. This is unbelievable. It's not from this earth. And had it not been authenticated and recorded, maybe we would have second thoughts to whether to believe it or not. Now this, though it was astonishing, yet Abdurrahman's attitude to it and stand was more astonishing. Because if someone does this to me, it's, it's freebies. Some, something for free. I'm going to take it. Let's accept it. Abdurrahman did not take, take neither of the two. He said, May Allah bless your wealth and bless your family. Just show me where the souk is. Show me the market. And he went to the market and in, in a few months' time, he became one of the richest merchants of Medina. And in a few years' time, he became the richest merchant of Arabia. And how, how was that? Because he was sincere, he was hard-working, and he was honest. He would not deal in usury, 
and he would not deal in anything that is forbidden. He would not cheat. He would be extremely honest. Yes. Is it because he tried to rely on himself and put his trust in Allah and go and he didn't accept you know, the offer of the people because he didn't accept people helping him or something? Or? Well, it can be, but that help was not a form of charity. It was Islamic in the sense that it is Allah's given right to you. So if you accept it, there's nothing wrong in that because it came to you from Allah. It's like someone giving you a gift. And this is one of the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, that he accepts gifts, but he does not accept charity. So if someone gives you something, it is impolite and it's improper for you to reject it. If I give you a pen as a, as a gift, even if I were poorer than you are, you have to accept it because this makes me feel good about it. Now, if you feel sorry for me, you may in return give me something equivalent or more valuable as a, a compensation, but you may never reject a gift. Now, Abdurrahman's stand from his brother Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a was not rejecting his gift. On the contrary, he appreciated it, but he wanted to keep this wealth to his brother and work on his own so that nothing would be in his brother's heart. Sa'ad ibn Rabi'a died on the battle of Uhud, but he was dying when the companion of the Prophet ﷺ went to him and told him that the Prophet ﷺ is safe and sound. Sa'ad was revealed, was, was relieved because he was afraid that he may die. So he asked him, how do you feel? How do you find yourself? And he told him that I am satisfied with everything that happened. Alhamdulillah. And I'd like you to convey the message to my brothers that you have no excuse at the side of Allah if anyone gets to the Prophet of Allah وسلم, and he died. Among the dead was also al Usayrim Amr ibn Thabit. And this guy was a disbeliever. Though living in Medina, he was a disbeliever. No matter how many times his companions went to him, he would not accept Islam. And they were shocked to find him among the dead. So they came to him and, and told him, what are you doing here? Have, have, have you gone out with your people just to defend them because of your patriotism? Because you're a patriot or because you're a nationalist or just because you wanted to fight with your people? He said, no. I came out because I believe that there is only one God worship, uh, worthy of being worshipped and that is Allah and that the Prophet ﷺ is his messenger. And he died. He died when they told the Prophet ﷺ about him. He told them that he is in paradise. Abu Huraira said, says that, subhanAllah, a man in paradise without even praying one single prayer. So initially he was on the side of the Quraysh? No, he was from Medina, from the Ansar. But he went with the people of Medina, with the Prophet ﷺ's army, without them noticing. Because as we know, whenever a, a non-Muslim came to aid the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet would tell him that we do not seek the aid of a non-Muslim, yeah. of a mushrik. So he went without them noticing and he indulged in, in the fighting among the Muslims, against the polytheists. Is this not another lesson of sincerity and hiding your intentions well he hid his intention because he did not intend to he was not going to fight with he, he did not accept Islam in the very beginning but when the army went he embraced Islam at that particular moment and then he immediately participated with the Muslims against the Mushrikeen so he didn't he didn't hide anything but he did not reveal his Islam to them and had he not told them, they would have thought that he was a disbeliever and would have treated him as a dis disbeliever. And this also teaches us a lesson that do not judge people to whether they will die as Muslims or they will die as non-Muslims. Because you do not know what took place seconds just before their soul left their bodies. Now, on the surface, 
we treat people as they have shown us in the sense that if someone accepted Islam and no one knew about that and he died and still no one knows about this we do not bury him with the Muslims we treat him as a non-Muslim and if a Muslim he shows to us that he appears to us like a Muslim but inside he's a hypocrite he's a disbeliever when he dies nobody knows about his intention except Allah we treat him as a Muslim and we wash him and we uh, uh, give him the Islamic uh, uh, funeral and we pray the funeral prayer on him and we bury him with the Muslims but on the day of judgment he will be in hell forever among the dead was also a brave man by the name of Qazman and Qazman killed eight of the polytheists by himself and they found him dying but he was not dead he was severely wounded and some of the the, 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 the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu were astonished by his bravery and there there is an authentic hadith whether it applies on Qazman or someone else Allah knows but it has the same meaning the Prophet saw والسلام, a man killing the enemy and wounding them a lot very brave man and the Muslims told the Prophet وسلم, that this man is the bravest among us no one has inflicted so much injury and deaths in the enemies like him so they were very proud of him the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said he's in hell so it, it, it was a shock to them one of the companions said I'll be with this man like his shadow until I know why the Prophet ﷺ condemned him and said that he was in hell even though he was fighting with the Muslim yes he was a Muslim he looked like a Muslim so the man says that he continued to see this man killing here and there until he got wounded very bad and it was so painful to the extent that the man could not bear this pain so he put the edge of his sword to his chest and the handle to the ground and then dropped himself forward killing himself Azman did the same they saw him while he was wounded and they said you fought bravely for the side of Allah he said no I did not I did this for my people I said, I'm just defending my people I didn't do it for Allah and he couldn't bear the pain and he killed himself the, pro the man who was with the Prophet the companion came back and said I believe that you are the messenger of Allah so the Prophet said why is that what brought this up he said the man who said that he was in hell he did so and so and so and finally he killed himself I'm afraid that we have a short break stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back <laughs> So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. and welcome back just before the break we were talking about Qazman and this man who went and killed bravely eight of the polytheists but then he killed himself and ended up his life to be in hell he told his people that he did not come to fight for the sake of Allah he came came only to fight because of his feelings towards his people and his need to defend his brothers and this teaches us that the most thing that a Muslim fears is how his life is going to end 
which means that there's a hadith and it's reported by or narrated by Abdullah bin Saud, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that a man can perform what seems to the people as good deeds for 60 years. And just before he dies, there is nothing between him and entering paradise except, you know, arms love. Yes. And just before he dies, he does something that entitles him to enter hell and he dies and he goes to hell. Therefore, we fear a lot this moment that Allah Azza wa would make us die in. And we always pray that Allah Azza wa concludes our deeds with something that is good. Because if your life ends in doing something that is good, then you are inevitably going to paradise. And vice versa, if it concludes in something that is bad, this means that you have something bad waiting for you, and God forbids. Do we learn from uh, that uh, event as well, that uh, suicide killing, uh, or we, that if a person kill, it, kill himself, or blow up himself, or do anything, even if in sake of the religion, that he's in hell as well, or this is like uh, something forbidden Islamically? Well, Again, this is an issue of dispute among scholars. A group of scholars say that this is acceptable because you're inflicting more harm in the enemy lines than yourself. And other scholars, and this I highly uh, believe and recommend, they think that, no, detonating a bomb to kill yourself, though you're killing others, this is considered to be suicide. And we cannot simply judge others without being in their circumstances. So it is up to their scholars in, their, in the occupied lands, the real scholars, to give the true and authentic verdict depending on the circumstances and the situation where they live in. But generally speaking, no. Suicide, suicide bombing is not acceptable. Discriminate killing is by no means acceptable. And this has nothing to do with, as we mentioned earlier, charging into the army uh, or to the enemy lines, fighting them until they kill you. This is different than you actually blowing yourself up or killing uh, uh, yourself. Was he the only companion that killed himself, Qasma? Um, this what appears. Qazman, it, it appears that he's the only one who committed suicide. And... Whether he is the same man or not, but this is what was reported to us, that a man fought bravely at the side of the Prophet ﷺ and then ended his life with his own hands. Sure. Was that not enough to lose him his deeds just because of the intention? Of course, that was an, enough by itself. But committing suicide also, the punishment for that is very severe. And some say that it, he will be punished in hell forever. But the authentic opinion is that if someone kills himself, it's a major sin, he will be punished in hell, but in, eventually he will go to paradise. The Prophet tells us, والسلام, and the hadith was reported in uh, uh, Muslim, that whoever kills himself with a weapon, or with a substance, or with an item, he will be punished till the day of judgment with the same item. So if he drank poison, he will keep on drinking poison in the, uh, in, in the barzakh. If he threw himself from a mountain or from a high place, he will be, be punished with the same punishment, finding and, 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 and suffering the same pain, and then doing it over and over and over again till Allah Azza wa knows when. And likewise, if someone stabs himself, he will be stabbing himself till the day of judgment and then it's hellfire may Allah protect us yes. and, and this is taking place in the, in the grave in the yes grave. yes because as we know we have three worlds this world we're living in and then there's the hereafter which is infinity and there's a transitional world in between and that's from the death of the person until he's resurrected and Allah knows how long that is and in this world the world of barzakh this transitional uh, uh, world, 
it depends on the person's deeds. If his deeds were good in the first world, he'll be enjoying winds and, and blows from paradise. And if his deeds were not as good, he will be suffering from the winds of hellfire until the day of judgment. The Prophet ﷺ instructed the companions to collect those who died at the side of Allah, the martyrs, and to bury them. And 70 graves to be buried is not an easy task, especially when those who are digging the graves are wounded, wounded themselves. No one was safe. Even the Prophet ﷺ was wounded himself and was suffering from his leg and from the wound in his head and his cheek and... Uh, and, and his, his teeth shoulder. yes and his shoulder so because of that the Prophet ﷺ instructed them to dig graves and to put two or three in the same grave and he instructed them to put first those who have Quran more so who, whenever he was brought with two or three of the men he instructed them that whoever recited Quran more than the other, who learned it by heart more, to be advanced in the grave. Were they washed? No. Mm -hmm. Were they dressed with, or, or wrapped with, with kafan, what we call in Arabic mm -hmm. kafan, the white clothes? No. Did the Prophet ﷺ pray on them? Again, no. Funeral prayer is a form of intercession. You're praying the funeral prayer and the dead uh, uh, body is in front of you, asking Allah that you may intercede for this dead person, that his sins would be forgiven and that he would be admitted to Jannah. The martyrs, they intercede for the living. As we said, uh, as we're told in the hadith, that whenever a person is a martyr, he intercedes for 70 of his family. And he's given 72 uh, brides from Jannah and with the first flow of blood Allah will forgive all of his sins and he will not be punished in his grave and he will not be uh, 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 terrorized or he will not fear on the day of resurrection all of these are given to a martyr so the Prophet ﷺ had them buried they came to the corpse of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. When he saw him, he was so sad that he cried the Prophet ﷺ. Hamza was his uncle and was his brother from suckling also. also. They were all fed by uh, uh, one uh, slave of Abi Lahab. Uh, her name was Thwaybia, Thwayba. And also Abu Salama, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, they were all brothers because they uh, uh, had their milk from the same woman. He was very sad and was very touched emotionally. Seeing his uncle with his nose and ears cut, with his guts coming out, they mutilated his body and came in his sister Safiya, the mother of Zubair ibn al-Awwam the Prophet's aunt came to see her brother and the Prophet ﷺ sent her son as Zubair and told him keep her away I don't want her to see her brother and she was a very very tough and strong woman and she looked at her son with a way that the son himself who was the, one of the bravest soldiers of Islam could not do anything about it and he told him go to the Prophet and ask him for permission to come because I want to see what they did to my brother if he's dead he's dead he's a martyr but they want to see him and the Prophet وسلم, allowed her to come she stood by her husband's by her brother's corpse and prayed for him that Allah would have mercy on him and she left Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was a very tall man very strong they could not find enough clothes to wrap him with so 
the clothes that he was wearing, when they covered his head, they could see his feet. And when they covered his feet, his, he his head would appear. And the same thing happened with Mus'ab ibn Umair. May Allah be pleased with him. One of the richest youngsters, youth of Mecca at the time. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, may Allah be pleased with him, reports, and this took a time about seven or eight years later, he was fasting on a Monday. And they brought him food so that he would break his fast. Imagine fasting after 16, 17 hours. And they brought him food to break his fast. And as he saw the food, he said, Mus'ab ibn Umair, who was much, much better than I was, we could not find clothes to cover him before burial. And all what I see and all what I feel that Allah Azza wa has granted us our blessings in this world, and I'm afraid that we may be deprived of getting it on the day or in the hereafter. And he rejected the food and went on crying. Look at the love and appreciation for those who died on the battle of Uhud. The Prophet himself وسلم, said to his companions, I wished I was amongst the dead, the, the, the dead on the hills or on, on, on the foot of the hill of Uhud. He himself wished that because he knew about the great reward of those who die at the side of Allah the Almighty. I believe that we have to stop here but I promise you, inshallah, when we meet next time, that we will continue to talk about what happened after the battle of Uhud. And until then, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.